Bestbookbits.com presents The Omnivore's Dilemma, A Natural History of Four Meals by Michael Pollan. What should we have for dinner? Ten years ago, Michael Pollan confronted us with this seemingly simple question, and with The Omnivore's Dilemma, his brilliant eye-opening exploration of our food choices demonstrated that how we answer it today may determine not only our health, but our survival as a species. In the years since, Pollan's revolutionary examination has changed the way Americans think about food bringing wide attention to the little-known but vitally important dimensions of food and agriculture in America. Poland launched a national conversation about what we eat and the profound consequences that even the simplest everyday food choices have on both ourselves and the natural world. Ten years later, the omnivore's dilemma continues to transform the way Americans think about the politics, perils, and pleasures of eating. The written and audio summary can be found on our website, bestbookbits.com. So without further ado, I'll bring in the book summary of The Omnivore's Dilemma. Book summary. The huge numbers of choices available today makes it hard to decide what to eat. This is The Omnivore's Dilemma. An omnivore, as we humans are capable of eating many different plants and animals, this leads to what psychologist Paul Rosen calls The Omnivore's Dilemma. With a world of possibilities, how do we know what we should eat? For early hunter-gatherers, solving this dilemma was very straightforward. They ate the seasonal foods they could be harvested near their homes, such as mushrooms in the fall or strawberries in the summer, and hunted game that was available in the wild. This was made a pretty uniform menu, which made choosing what to eat very easy. Today, advances in our ability to preserve and transport food has completely changed the way different foods are available to us. Think back to the last time you were in the supermarket. How many aisles were there? How many shelves? How many items on each shelf? Coconuts, leeks, Oreos, bacon, eggs, rice, broccoli, strawberries. The selection of food available today is mind-boggling. And you can basically have whatever you want, whenever you want it, wherever you are. This development has exacerbated the omnivore's dilemma, as we must now choose among countless options for each meal. Some are healthy and some are tasty, some are cheap and some are good for the environment. So exactly what should we eat? Summary part one, industrial agriculture makes food cheap, but its environmental, public health and ethics cost are sky high. Once upon a time, farmers grew crops and grazed cattle using nothing but the sun and soil. However, such traditional farming methods only produce relatively small quantities of local seasonal food and are no longer enough to feed the world's population. Hence, farmers have developed industrial farming techniques and machines to produce food faster and on a larger scale. Some people would say this is a good thing. In the past, it was expensive to raise, feed, and slaughter livestock for food. And as a result, meat was expensive. People didn't eat it every day. Now, however, industrial farming methods have made raising livestock and, in effect, meat itself incredibly cheap. Out of season produce has only become widely available. You live in Seattle, but you want fresh asparagus in January. No problem. It's shipped from Argentina. Add to this that the fact that the growth seasons of many plants have been extended to unnatural lengths through industrial farming techniques, and you can pretty much buy any fruit or vegetable, whatever the season. Unfortunately, cheap meat and year-round asparagus come at a cost. In the name of efficiency and mass production, large-scale industrial agriculture pollutes the air and water, pumps chemicals and pesticides into our food, treats animals unethically, and spreads diseases. Summary part two, corn is one of the most important crops in the United States, and it's heavily subsidized by the government. Corn is very adaptable and genetically robust. It produces large harvests quicker than other crops, so when Europeans discovered corn when they colonized the Americas in the 16th century, it quickly became a staple crop. As technology advanced, farmers began breeding corn hybrids to optimize output even further. Advancements included thicker stalks and stronger root systems that could withstand harsh mechanical harvesting and also stand closer together to fit more plants per acre. As the varieties were adopted by farmers, corn production quickly increased. In 1920, farmers produced 20 bushels of corn per acre. Now they produce 180. In 2005, it cost a farmer about $2.50 to produce a bushel of corn. But due to the abundance of corn, buyers were only willing to pay $1.45 per bushel. Of course, if farmers were to lose a dollar on every bushel of corn they produced, they would go out of business, which is why the US government subsidizes the farmers by making up the difference. 
With such subsidies, the system of supply and demand becomes irrelevant. The farmers simply flood the market with corn and still make a wholly artificial profit on every bushel. Hence, the price of corn keeps dropping, but the US keeps producing more corn. Summary part three. To sell the excess corn farmers produce, companies add processed corn-based ingredients to food. These days, corn is less of a food and more of a commodity. In fact, one in four items in the average American supermarket contains corn in one form or another. Chicken nuggets, for example, are usually made of cornstarch, corn oil, and chicken that was fed corn. So why is corn everywhere? Food industry executives have long faced a fixed stomach problem. Every person can only eat about 1,500 pounds of food each year. To grow, food industry companies like General Mills and McDonald's have convinced people to A, spend more money on those 1,500 pounds of food, and or B, eat more than 1,500 pounds of food per year. In this regard, America's huge corn surplus is particularly problematic since there is more corn than the population could possibly eat. This is why so much of our corn goes into so-called wheat mills, where it is repurposed to create a wide array of artificial sounding ingredients, such as high fructose corn syrup, or hydrogenated fat, found on nutritional facts labels. These synthetic ingredients are then used in a variety of foods like soda, TV dinners, breakfast cereals, and so forth. These new uses for excess corn are very profitable for the food industry, heavy processing greatly extends the shelf life of products, allowing food corporations to take a larger slice of the profits and leaving farmers with less. When you buy chicken nuggets, for example, you pay very little for the actual chicken and a lot for the services required to turn the corn into synthetic corn-based ingredients and then those into something that resembles food. Summary part four, meat prices have been brought down by the use of monolithic mass feeding operations called Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, or CAFOS. Besides going into processed foods, much of the corn surplus is also used to feed farm animals that we later eat. From the food industry's perspective, animals are like machines that turn excess corn into sellable meat, though machines are usually treated better. Enter Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, or CAFOS for short. CAFOs are facilities for raising animals unlike any farm you have imagined. They maximize efficiency and profit by cramming as many animals as possible into cages or pens while automating and mechanicizing as much farm work as possible, such as feeding. This efficiency ethos as well as the cheap feed due to the corn surplus has brought meat prices down to previously unheard of levels. Before the advent of Concentrated animal feeding operations, the care, time, and resources needed to raise animals on small local farms meant meat was expensive, a rare treat. But today, a bacon cheeseburger, for example, is so cheap that you can eat one every day if you want to, something many people do. Summary part five, to keep meat cheap, concentrated animal feedlots treat animals unethically and cause huge environmental and health risks. At first glance, Concentrated animal feedlots might even sound like a good thing. Who would object to cheap and delicious bacon cheeseburgers? Unfortunately, they come at a price of animal rights, sustainability, and public health. Concentrated animal feedlots operate by optimizing output to maximize profit. Animals are forced into crowded spaces without access to pasture or space to move around, leading to suffering and the spread of diseases. Corn is so cheap that concentrated animal feedlots use it as an animal feed whether the animals have evolved to eat it or not. Even a carnivorous fish like salmon is being re-engineered to tolerate corn. Because cattle won't normally eat corn either, at concentrated animal feedlots they suffer from all the manner of illnesses, think bloat so intense that it can press on a cow's lungs and suffocate it, and heartburn so severe it causes ulcers, liver disease and weakened immune system. The only way to keep animals alive until slaughter is in such conditions is by pumping them full of antibiotics. However, overusing antibiotics to keep sick animals alive can lead to the development of antibiotic-resistant superbugs, which can wreak havoc in the human populations too. If you thought that was the worst of concentrated animal feedlots, offences, think again. They also contaminate downstream waters with the hormones and heavy metals they use. 
The fertilizer the animals produce is often used on industrial farms and could easily spread a new lethal strain of E. coli born in the dangerously unhealthy conditions at concentrated animal feedlots. Ethics. The environment and public health are all secondary concerns to concentrated animal feedlots. What they really care about is maximizing efficiency and profit. Summary part six, organic food offers some benefits over conventionally produced food. Originally, the movement started as a grassroots initiative to solve a lot of problems caused by the industrial agriculture, pollution, pesticides, and the fossil fuel demands of shipping fruits and vegetables around the country. Organic was more expensive than conventional produce, but the process was much better for the environment and food far healthier for people. At the beginning of the movement, many farmers started out by selling produce from stands on the side of the road rather than shipping their products across the country. And rather than using pesticides and chemical fertilizer, they used natural, often local compost or manure from nearby farms. Many studies have compared organic produce with that grown in industrially. The results indicate that produce grown without pesticides and chemical inputs is both better tasting and healthier. When tomatoes are allowed to grow at their natural pace without chemicals to speed up the growth, they develop thicker cell walls which gives them more concentrated flavors and hence a far better taste. What's more, other studies have found that organic fruits and vegetables contain more vitamins and cancer-fighting polyphenols than conventional ones. Summary part seven, but the organic food system today is far from perfect. Picture a happy cow grazing on luscious green grass amid rolling hills. This is probably where you imagine your organic milk came from, particularly because the image often adorns organic milk cartons. This ideal is compelling, so compelling that customers are willing to pay a higher price for it and the food companies know this. But organic doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. As the organic movement gained popularity, small idyllic farms like the one in your imagination couldn't keep up with the demand. They expanded, and that meant sacrificing some of the movement's original ideals. In fact, many problems of conventional agriculture are present on large-scale organic farms too. As the organic business grew, the US Department of Agriculture developed lax standards that allowed food companies to cut corners and still get labels like organic or free range, for which environmentally conscious consumers are willing to pay more. Although smaller producers fought for stricter regulations, big corporations won out. Under these vague guidelines, you can, for example, cram 20,000 chickens into a shed with two weeks access to a small yard and call them free range. Similarly, oddities like organic TV dinners and organic high fructose corn syrup have emerged. Although smaller organic farms do still exist, most organic food in the supermarket comes from big ones that cut corners. This is because supermarkets want to stock a full range of fruits and vegetables year round, regardless of local and seasonable availability. Unfortunately, small companies usually only produce what grows locally and seasonally, whereas large ones can use industrial techniques to overcome these limitations. Summary part eight, management intense grazing is a far more natural and sustainable alternative to overproducing corn. As we've already learned, corn plays a major role in creating the myriad of problems of conventional food systems. Not least of which is the havoc corn wreaks on cows' digestive systems. But growing corn also neglects many natural co-evolutionary relationships that could be taken advantage of. One of the best ways to optimize production sustainability is to grow grass instead of corn and use the management intensive grazing, a farming technique that involves moving animals to different pastures every day to promote optimal grass growth using the plant's natural growth cycle. This method takes advantage of the co-evolutionary relationship between cows and grass that is wholly ignored in the industrial agriculture. Cows don't overgraze their favorite kinds of grass. This allows a diversity of species to thrive in the pasture, and at the same time they get to enjoy their natural diet rather than harmful corn that makes them sick and bloated. And healthier cows produce healthier meat. Management intensive grazing is also better for the environment. The natural biodiversity of grass that flourishes unheard of in the sea of corn is that is the American Midwest maximizes absorption of solar energy and carbon. 
the grass effectively takes thousands of pounds of carbon out of the atmosphere and stores it underground. Summary Part 9. Small local farms provide an economically, environmentally and ethically sustainable alternative. Our current system for producing food values, efficiency and profits over ethical concerns, environmental sustainability and consumers' health. So what can we do? We can buy from small local farms instead of large industrial ones. First of all, buying locally helps reduce the amount of fossil fuels needed to transport food from the producer to the consumer, a distance which might today span countries or even continents. Also, from an economic standpoint, buying locally helps put profits in the hands of small business owners and farmers rather than huge corporations. What's more, small local farms don't rely on pesticides or unnatural farming techniques to produce large amounts of food. Instead, they grow food seasonally, promoting the natural ecosystem rather than interfering with it. This makes them the obvious environmental choice too. Finally, local farms are almost always more ethical choice. Being able to drive down the road to see a butcher or a farmer at work creates accountability, which makes them less likely to resort to unethical practices, such as treating animals poorly just to increase profits. In review, The Omnivore's Dilemma Book Summary. The key messages in this book. Much of the foods we eat today is produced industrially, which often means unethical practices. Environmental damage and that the food contains some processed derivative of corn. A crop produced far in excess of our needs. While organic food does provide some advantages over this system, it is not without its problems. The best solution is to buy from small local farms. And that's a wrap on the book summary of The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Check out a YouTube channel with over 500 video book summaries uploaded previously. Like the video, comment on what you think, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out our website, bestbookbits.com, with over 500 written book summaries, which you can download in the PDF version. Sign up to our weekly email where you'll get the latest book summaries in the comments below by popping your email address in. If you're into the audio podcast version, check out mixcloud.com forward slash bestbookbits, where you'll find over 500 audiobook summaries to listen to at your pleasure. Follow us on Instagram for daily motivational quotes and book summaries. Thanks for watching and listening. Hope you got something out of this. Go out there. Have an amazing day. Take care. Bye-bye now.